Hi, welcome to Victoria Knits. I'm Victoria. Today is April 24th and I'm feeling pretty happy because after all that whining in my last episode, we are up at Lone Pine State Park overlooking the beautiful Swan Range Mountains and the Whitefish Range Mountains. And in the middle, if you look back there at the highest peaks, you can see a little bit of Glacier National Park from here. But I also wanted to point out that I have finished my second Flax Light sweater and I love it. The, uh, the yarn I used was Lolo Did It's um, Ugly Sweater. Hannah made its costumes and cocktails and also Hannah made its high functioning and up in yarns bursting in purple. Now this is my second flax light sweater. I did make one previously, which I also really, really love. I have to say, I did not do a swatch on this sweater. And when I, also I made a mistake when I started knitting it because it calls for a size two needle and a size five needle. I don't know what I was thinking, but I did not switch to the size five. I continued on in the two but I am such a loose knitter that it worked out just perfectly for me, which is crazy. This is the size medium slash large. Uh, this sweater comes in lots of different sizes, medium, medium slash large, and large. And I did the medium slash large. I have plans to do um, a couple more of this sweater because I love it. I, I wear these all the time. Uh, even my new one and I just I just adore them and I it's just a great way to use up some of the lovely sock yarn I have and so it's just really worked out well for me so I think spring has arrived here in Northwest Montana which is I'm very happy to report and as I said behind me on the highest peaks you can see Glacier National Park from here, just barely. So I think what we should do is we should go there because when you live this close to Glacier National Park, it's always calling your name. All right, so after a couple hours of driving, we are at Glacier National Park. This is the Two Medicine area. Before going to the Sun Road was built, Two Medicine was the main destination for visitors to the park. We can't get any closer than we are now because it's too snowed in down at the campground and the road is closed off. So this is about it. And today is May 14th. I just want to make that clear. This is not the next day. It's May 14th. And I have to say, I, you know, I had a list for this podcast of things I wanted to have knit. Um, I didn't stick to that list. I didn't stick to that list at all. And I will tell you all about that soon. But I do want to tell you um, about this book I found called Glacier National Park After Dark. It is by John Ashley. I saw this book for the first time at our uh, veterinarians. We have our veterinarian lives in a little town of Kyla, which is just 10 miles away from us. It is 10 miles, uh, it's halfway between us and Kalispell. And this book was in their waiting room and I was leafing through it and I thought, this is gorgeous. I really need to go home and buy this. And so I did. And I thought this would be a great thing to talk about on my podcast because you know how much I love Glacier National Park. So I contacted the author and then I saw that he actually lives in Kyla, just 10 miles away from us. He lives in Kyla. Um, 
he wrote everything in this book and he took all the photographs and I emailed him and asked him if I could use some of this on my podcast and he said absolutely thank you for asking just make sure everyone knows that they're my photographs so I will put his name on each one of the pictures so John's John writes the photographs in this book were born from more than 100 excursions into glaciers darkness spanning almost 30 years. Nights spent in a wilderness are never boring. Unpredictable weather and untamed animals have a way of waking your dulled and domesticated senses. Localized mountain-induced clouds are a common radar-evading nemesis to night photography. Other challenges, including minus 21 degrees Fahrenheit battery-killing temperatures during a comet, 40 miles per hour tripod shaking wind during a winter eclipse, nosy tripod bumping bighorn rams in moonlight, and an occasional grizzly bear passing in the night, to name a few of, from the following pages. And he says, Glacier's visitation and appreciation grows each year. Out among the parks, Jacob Mountains, and forested valleys, Taking good pictures in daylight is sort of like throwing rocks at the nearest planet. It's rather hard to miss no matter where you aim. Photography at night, however, is a different affair altogether. Chasing our dreams can run us ragged during the day. Night is where we lie still, turn introspective, and wait to receive our personal visions. This difference, I think, is reflected in these photographs that were quietly crafted in the dark. John writes, there are more stars in the universe than pebbles on any beach, and sparkling night skies have also provided meaning and comfort. Night gives us the knowledge that every atom in our body was born in a star's heart, and our every cell is nursed by the sun through the plants and animals of this little planet. Night also provides the foundations for all our comforting faiths and religions supporting the narratives that help us navigate an honorable life of spiritual wonder. Reclaiming the night sky would reconnect us to our ancestors, nurture our health, and remind us of our humble position within the cosmos. This photograph is called Lake MacDonald Pearls, and his story about it is, One night, many summers back, I found myself sitting beside my tripod on a gravelly lake shore while my camera clicked off one image every 30 seconds as programmed. A full moon slowly sank behind Apgar village. With so much time to think, I was running out of ideas. I stared out across the, a moonlit Lake MacDonald over to the Fish Creek campground and picnic area. The gears started grinding as I tried to triangulate in my mind. If I was over there, and the moon's over there, and the wind dies down again, can I capture the whole arc from moonrise to moonset? I was back before sunset, measuring angles and setting up my tripod at the picnic area, when a couple of young campers walked down to skip stones on the lake. What are you taking pictures of, they asked. My camera was sitting on a tripod at the water's edge. Nothing yet, I answered, but at sunset, the full moon will rise right over there, and eventually it'll set over here. Momentary silence. You mean you're going to stand out here all night? It was a fair question. Well, yes, I answered, almost. The moon sets around four, then I'll go home. They didn't say another word. Instead, both of them backed slowly away from the crazy guy with a camera. I spent the next six hours walking in circles, scribbling notes, and hoping that the ranger on duty didn't show up in the middle of the night to blind me with his flashlight and shine it all over my camera setup. John talks a lot in this book about the benefits of darkness, and I had never really thought about that before. We, Kim and I usually sleep with a nightlight on, but after I read this book, I actually, I turn that off every night now. John says, step outside at night in whitefish, and you'll be lucky to count a dozen stars overhead. Stand around in the shadows for 20 minutes, and if a curious cop doesn't show up first, a couple dozen stars will eventually appear. Glance at your bright cell phone before looking up again, and suddenly you're back to less than a dozen stars. 
the same thing happens when you drive into Glacier at night with your headlights on, which I strongly recommend. Wait for 20 minutes in Glacier's darkness and you'll discover at least 3,000 glimmering stars waiting. This is our ancient night vision, a forgotten skill. Rods and cones use chemicals to convert photons into electrical messages that the brain can understand. But bright light uses up these chemicals faster than our cones can replenish them. We need 20 to 60 minutes of darkness to refuel our eyes for night viewing. Astrom astronomers, astronomers and the odd photographer wear red headlamps, not white, because red light doesn't deplete these eye chemicals or dim our night vision. Red headlamps also have the added feature of making techno geeks look really, really cool. We know lots of cool things about rods and cones, but like Larry the Serious Stooge, we know a lot less about our third eye. In addition to rods and cones, we have a third type of light sensitive cell in our eyes, in our retinas, called the retinal ganglion cells, RGC. These microscopic cells have a huge effect when humans and light meet. RGCs regulate the production of melatonin by sending sig signals to our pineal gland perched near the middle of our brains like some mysterious portal between two lumpy hemispheres. Our pineal gland, skin, and eyes are the only organs that are light sensitive. Named for its pine cone shape, the brain's pineal gland is so dedicated to light that it was once considered to be a third eye. The gland has just one function. When RGCs and our eyes detect darkness, the pineal gland secretes melatonin. That's it. Melatonin is a hormone with three rather important functions. It controls our circadian body functions, regulates our reproductive hormones, and keeps cancer cells from growing. When it's not dark, when it's when it's dark, we produce melatonin. When it's light, not so much. I love the Northern Lights pictures he includes in this book. And John says, because the aurora borealis is tied to magnetic fields, it's mostly a polar phenomenon. Montana is a little more than halfway from the equator to the North Pole, and we see the dancing lights about half as often as people living in the Canadian provinces to our north. High latitude locations don't turn completely dark in midsummer, but their winter nights are extra long. That's why northern lights are sometimes mistakenly thought of as winter events. Auroras aren't. They just show up better when the dance floor lights are dimmed. And do you see the Milky Way at night where you live? When people die, according to the Blackfoot story, their spirits travel along the wolf's trail to the sky world, where their campfires sparkle once again at night like so many stars. Smoke from their fires form the dark areas. Every clear night is an opportunity to look up and remember family and friends who have journeyed on ahead of us. When you're driving cross country on your way to somewhere, you won't pass by here. Glacier National Park really isn't on the way to anywhere else. You have to go out of your way, driving on two lane roads for hours to get lost in this part of Montana. That and our impressive collection of potholes are two reasons why we can still see the Milky Way from here. The ability to see the Milky Way on clear, moonless nights has become the litmus test to measure how much light pollution surrounds you. On the Borel scale of one to nine, where one is comparable to pre-industrial darkness, most of the park is now between one and two. In 2006, John Bortle published a one to nine scale for amateur astronomers to use when estimating night sky darkness. The night sky over Lake McDonald has been replaced with the sky chart from Stellarium. From left to right, our current night sky darkness is just above a Bortle scale one. This represents an excellent dark sky location. A Bortle three location has lost some of the fainter stars, and this would represent a rural sky. Bortle 5 has lost most of the fainter stars, representing a suburban or small town sky. In a Bortle 7 night sky, the Milky Way is lost, as are most of the stars. And in a Bortle 9 night sky, only a handful of the brightest stars are visible 
through the artificial glow, which is what happens in the inner city sky. The U.S. population is currently growing at 1.5% annually, but the average rate of light growth is 6% per year. This amounts to a doubling of light pollution every 10 years and 11 months. A worldwide average of 3% light growth means doubling light pollution every 23 years. Too much artificial light at night is no longer just an issue for astronomers and dreamers like me. These nights, light, light pollution negatively affects nearly every form of life on our little planet. Light is a very good thing. The problem is that light at night is unnatural. The vast majority of earthly animal and plant life forms are hormonally programmed for one long uninterrupted period of darkness during each 24-hour cycle. Light pollution causes behavioral and biological reactions that fly in the face of three billion years of natural light-dark cycles. This messes up behavioral cues in insects, frogs, birds, mammals, etc. And for us, too much light after sunset triggers a series of hormonal effects that, unlike the light itself, can be toxic or fatal. Currently, 16 states and a number of municipalities have established lighting ordinances, including Kalispell, Whitefish, and Missoula, Montana. Tucson, Arizona, home of the International Dark Sky Association, in instituted a lighting ordinance back in 1972. While Tucson's population has doubled in the last 20 years, its night sky brightness has actually decreased slightly over the same period. So it can be dealt with if people are aware and realize it's a problem. I really, really enjoyed this book. It was a great read, and I thank John Ashley so much for allowing me to use it on my podcast. It's, it's been a real eye-opener. I am amazed at his photography. It's just gorgeous. And his dedication to being out at night in Glacier National Park, which is something that would, uh, frankly, frighten me quite a bit. So um, I will link below my podcast to, this, to where you can purchase this book if you're interested. I will also link to the Dark, Dark Skies Awareness Project and the Night Sky Network websites if you're interested. So as I said, I had a list and I will talk about the reasons I altered from that list. Um, one of the things I decided to uh, start was another um, flax light sweater. Are we all really surprised at that? No, we're not surprised at that. I'm doing another one because I love this pattern so much. This um, yarn the first yarn i'm using is from big sky yarn company and it's called pink lemonade it is gorgeous the next color i've moved in here is ephraim it's called neon blast i believe it's very very pretty this time i've decided to do this um sweater in the size large instead of the medium slash large because i want to be able to wear this during the winter and possibly put a turtleneck on under it for extra warmth or something like that. So I thought I would try the next size up. It's not, it doesn't increase it too many stitches, so I, I think it'll work out just fine. I'm pretty excited about it. Also, I realized when I was knitting that pattern that there is a place in it that tells you to increase evenly, like by a certain number of stitches for the next round. But she doesn't tell you how to do that. I was wondering what everyone else uses for that little formula. I have found uh, a website that I use where you plug in your numbers and it works out perfectly for me. And I will link that below um, also in my podcast uh, below the YouTube video. There was another little thing I used that I used on my Gramp sweater in the last podcast that I didn't talk about. And that is a little app and I will insert a picture of that and the name of it. And I use that when I want to put buttons on a cardigan. And I want to have them spaced correctly because you can choose um, how many stitches you're going to make your buttonhole. You're going to make a two stitch buttonhole, three stitch buttonhole, larger or bigger. And then you tell it how many stitches you have in the section you're putting your buttons. And it gives you the formula of, you know, how many, 
knit this many stitches, do your buttonhole, knit this many stitches, do your buttonhole. I found that, I find that really handy and I use that quite a bit too. So I decided to try something a little new. I decided to try some double knitting. Uh, as I talked about in my last podcast, um, the podcast, Hey, It's Catherine, she had done a double knit cowl and I thought it was really pretty. So I looked up some double knitting patterns and I decided to try a blanket for my um, upcoming grandson. And this is the double knit reversible heart blanket. I'll put the name on the below here. Um, it's turning out really pretty. It didn't start out like this. I started out with brunette yarn and I'll insert a little video of how that looked. Uh, there wasn't enough contrast. I was having trouble telling where the knits and pearls were. Um, yeah, it was a mess. My gauge was really off because you could see, as you can see in this video, you could see the, the other side through there. I just wasn't happy with it. I restarted this pattern about um, three or four times before I finally got it right. But I'm liking the way it's knitting up. It's puckering a little bit because there's some garter stitch in between all the squares, but I don't mind that. I think it'll, I think it'll still um, lay down okay. Um, it's a cute pattern and double knitting is not tough. <laughs> Once you get it figured out, I recommend you try it if you want to. It's, it's not that complicated. I have a scarf that I want to do for myself for this winter and it is double knit and I've already bought the yarn for that. So I'm looking forward to getting, getting this finished for my newest grandson uh, who will be here early July. And um, yeah, it's nice to try something new. <laughs> So I said I had a list and the reason I didn't get the list done was I had been working on this chrysalis wrap and I really wanted to have it finished by this podcast. It is not finished. I am on section four and I, this is section four, and I have one more section to go. What happened was I was knitting along, here's the right side, let's show you the right side. I was knitting, knitting along with it just fine. Everything was going perfectly. I was working on one of the lace repeats and all of a sudden I looked up and it's like I don't know where I'm at I, I don't remember where I'm at so then I thought well I'll just back up I'll just tink back right that's what you do well when I tinked back I thought I convinced myself I had made mistakes <laughs> at the beginning of the row so then I thought well now I need to go back to down to the next row it didn't work I couldn't tink back what ended up happening was this ended up back into two balls of yarn and I was very, very frustrated and had to start completely over. Kim's comment when I was complaining to him about all this <laughs> was... Why the hell don't you put a safety <laughs> line on every project? Exactly. Especially a new project you've never tried before. <laughs> it's going to be difficult and you don't know what's going to happen. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, that's pretty much what he said. And I said, well, I will put a safety line in. <clears throat> I had first told him I will put a safety line in. And when I explained what a safety line was, he gave me this look like, are you insane? Why would you not have already had one in there? But what were you thinking? And he's right. I should have. I really, I should have. <laughs> and at points with that, uh, there have been different knitting places with this wrap that I wished I'd had too because sometimes I'll go back to my safety line and there's still something messed up before it. It's been, it's been quite frustrating. It's not the pattern. It's, it's me. It, and this thing is taking a lot of focus. There's a lot of beautiful different stitch patterns, but, um, yeah, it's been driving me a little bit crazy. I'm really looking forward to having it finished. It will get finished. So my question to you guys is, are you always using a safety line? Cause I certainly don't. I'll usually put in a safety line if it's got a lot of lace on the pattern. I don't know why I didn't do it on this one. That was really, really stupid of me. But I, I have one in now. So how often do you use a safety line? That's just a, I don't use one in everything I knit. I would never put one in my flax light sweaters. That would annoy the hell out of me. I don't, it just, it just wouldn't make any sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my question for you. And if you put a comment down below the video, that would be great. Thanks, honey. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> we stopped at the monument to the Continental Divide. 
This is uh, commemorates Theodore Roosevelt. Our friend Britt joined us on this trip. He was here visiting. It was really nice to have him here. We stopped and saw the Silver Stairs Falls. Very pretty. We managed to see one mountain goat. And we had lunch at the Isaac Walton Inn, where you can sleep in a caboose. Pretty cool. So I'm back home. You can see some daffodils blooming behind me. Uh, Kim planted those two years ago. I apologize for the rough video from the wind when we were in Glacier. There's no way I can control that. Um, just happens. I hope you made it through that. Uh, yeah, Kim planted these daffodils two years ago and then he put a bunch of uh, grape hyacinths in the middle and those are getting ready to bloom. So I am wearing my Stofu Day sweater that I finished last year. I really like it. It's very spring looking. The yarn is by Lolo Did It. In uh, the earlier podcast when I was at Glacier, I was wearing my uh, You Better Like Pink tee. And you can uh, see more details about both of those in, uh, my, on my Ravelry page. I, on uh, Ravelry, I am Victoria Jean. And on Instagram, I am Victoria Jean W. I also have a Ravelry podcast group, uh, Victoria Knits, if you're interested in that. You may or may not remember, I started a Christmas sweater loosely based on the flax um, pattern by Tin Can Knits. And I finished it. It's finished. It's a big, big sweater. And I just kind of put on it what I felt like at the time i found the graph for these snowmen i found a graph for the um, trees i put funky little different buttons on the snowmen the uh, sleeves are different these are supposed to be elves i think or santas i bought these little pom-pom things to put on their hats and i put little eyes on them and then some more snowflakes uh, different kind different pattern of snowflakes some um what I hoping look like holly on that sleeve. The sleeves do not match, which I thought was kind of fun. On this sleeve, I have what looks like a reindeer, I hope. And then um, I was kind of hoping these look like poinsettias down here. That was the idea. And then this part was supposed to be prettier than it turned out, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> it's gonna be a nice, uh, nice big bulky comfy Christmas sweater this winter and I, I'm glad I, I'm glad I made it. Um, I had a lot of fun doing it. I didn't follow any rules. You know, I, I uh, reduced the sleeves to where I needed them to be for each pattern I was doing and uh, just tried it on as I went and it seemed fine. So I'm, I'm happy with it and I really like it. Also, I had a birthday last month and while my daughter and son-in-law were here visiting when they came to pick up Russell from us, I was winding up a ball of yarn with the Swift that I won in a, con in a giveaway from David Dogdare. Thanks, David. And my son-in-law was questioning me about it because I was just rolling up the yarn into a, little, into a ball because I don't have a ball winder. And I explained that to him. Well, he remembered it and he and my daughter sent me a ball winder for my birthday. So I immediately <laughs> took it out on the back porch and wound up four balls of yarn for my the, the new flax light sweater I started. It was really fun. And even Kim said, wow, those are very professional looking balls of yarn. I said, yes, they are. So thank you very much, Vanessa and Chris. Another thing I got for my birthday was my friend Carol in Boise sent me this pillow that she crocheted the cover to. I think it's really pretty. She did a nice job. Who can't use another pillow, right? She said she it reminded her, she said the pattern reminded her of a 
painting that my daughter Vanessa did on our pantry door when we lived in Boise. Vanessa likes to paint. That's her uh, artistic outlet. And she painted um, this sunflower scene on our pantry door. And it was based on this photograph that either Kim or I took in our garden in Boise. We had a rather large flower garden when we lived there that we're very proud of that um, pretty much consumed us. But thanks, Carol, I really like, I really like the pillow. I got one more thing finished. Um, I, I finished these Shaken Not Stirred socks. The pattern is by Wendy Geckner. I really like them. I think they turned out very nicely. I enjoyed the pattern. Once I got going on it, it became, you know, quite easy to do. It's not, it's not as complicated as it might look. It's pretty easy. So, um, but I like it. So I would, I would definitely recommend that pattern. I think they turned out nice. I look forward to wearing these. I think that's about it for this podcast. There'll be some off the porch segment where I'll, I will update you on the new chicks and the new ducks and a few other things. I really appreciate you watching. Um, if you're a new subscriber, thank you. If you haven't subscribed yet and you would like to, that would be greatly appreciated. Thumbs ups are also really appreciated. Uh, just thank you everyone for stopping by. Um, I know it's, um, it's a slightly different podcast and not for everybody, and I get that. Anyway, happy knitting wherever you are. I hope the weather is lovely. Uh, thanks for watching, and goodbye from Montana. See you later. We've been seeing quite a few rabbits on our walks right now. They're very pretty. This bald eagle was checking out our chickens and our neighbor's chickens the other day, but luckily it flew off without getting anything. And deer been hanging out again. I don't know what they were doing in uh, this segment. Playing? Fighting? Not sure. And the ducks have definitely graduated from swimming in the bathtub to swimming outside. And the chicks are growing up, not nearly as fast as the ducks. Here they're playing a little game of worm, worm, who's got the worm? We have named them. The yellow one is butterscotch, the black one is brownie, and the black and white one is bonbon. Our cat Jesse likes to hang out with me too, but we do not trust him alone with the baby chicks. And I was really worried about the uh, chickens and ducks first meeting because chickens can be um, quite aggressive uh, when they try to control the pecking order, but there was really nothing to worry about.
and it's definitely hummingbird season. They are here and I have been obsessed with them. They're so pretty. Did you catch that tongue coming out? Let's watch that in slow motion. <laughs> 